grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The text for our sermon is that gospel reading from Luke chapter 9. I want you to listen again to verses 35 and 36. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. You may be seated. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we stand this morning on the precipice of Lent. Lent is just around the corner. It will be here in literal days. This Wednesday, we'll gather back in this sanctuary where we will have ashes smeared on our foreheads and we'll hear those words, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. And with that morbid reminder of our mortality, of our sin, we will enter into the valley of the season of Lent, a time where we put our alleluias away, a time where we focus on repentance and sin and Christ's suffering. But today, before we enter into that valley of suffering and repentance, before he bids us leave the mount, we get one last joyful, triumphant, glory-filled epiphany of Jesus. One last unveiling to end this season of epiphanies. This season of glimpsing who this babe from Bethlehem is. Weeks ago, we started off this epiphany season with that account, that narrative of the baptism of Christ. We saw in that account heaven ripping open. Heaven and earth coming together as God the Father said to Jesus in the water, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Today's account of the transfiguration is the second bookend to the baptism of Jesus. They surround this season of epiphany. Today echoes the great news that we heard back at the baptism. It reaffirms the news of who Jesus is. And once again, it brings heaven and earth together. Luke tells us this morning that all of this occurred eight days after Jesus had talked with, the, with his disciples about his suffering. Jesus, earlier in Luke chapter 9 and in the gospel, has started to focus on death, suffering, crucifixion, bleeding and dying, taking up your cross and following after him. The verse right before this, Jesus said, Some of you, a few of the disciples, would not taste death until they first saw the kingdom of God. And here we get the story of those three lucky guys, of Peter and John and James, who get to see, to get to glimpse the very kingdom of God, heaven itself. They get this mountaintop experience before they have to enter into the valley of Christ's suffering in Jerusalem and eventually their own sufferings. So this morning... With all of that in mind, I want you to imagine that you are in the shoes of Peter, James, and John. Actually think about what this experience looked like, what it felt like, what it meant. These three men still wondering about all that death talk Jesus has been doing. Hike up a mountain with him for a prayer time. But no sooner do they start this prayer service than they realize that they're in for quite a different experience altogether. These guys are in for the experience of a lifetime. For suddenly, right before their faces, heaven and earth meet. They come together. This Jesus, their Savior, their teacher, their rabbi, changes before their eyes. He begins to glow to shine, to radiate, to explode with bright light. The kind of light that makes you squint and turn away. The kind you can't fully look at. It's coming right out from Jesus. It's out of this world. And the fireworks aren't done there. For now, suddenly, as their Jesus begins to glow with this otherworldly light, there appears in front of them two great giants of the faith, Moses and Elijah. 
the leaders of the Old Testament church and the leaders of the New Testament church surround Jesus on top of this mountain on this day. There's Moses, the summary of the law of God. And there's Elijah, the greatest of all the prophets of God. <clears throat> These two men that summarize all of the Old Testament for us appear here with Jesus. And though they have long been dead, here they stand alive. Alive in Christ, around this one who radiates glory. Moses and Elijah then begin to talk with Jesus. They talk with Jesus about his departure. In Greek, it's literally his exodus. They talk about Jesus' exodus. About what he's about to do in Jerusalem. About Holy Week. About the same thing Jesus just talked about earlier in Luke. About his suffering and his death. About his cross about the entire reason that he came. It's all been about this. All the way back to Exodus in the Old Testament and Moses and Elijah. It's been about this guy standing on this mountain and what he's leaving the mountain to go do. These men appear back from the dead, but they're not the ones shining. It's Jesus. It's all about him. Like the moon to the sun, these two great giants of the faith simply reflect and radiate the light coming from Jesus. Now at this point, the disciples can't take it. They can't handle it. They've fallen asleep, become unconscious, become like those who are dead. They couldn't handle being in the glory of God, this unbridled glory of the sun. And as they come to, as they wake up from their stupor, as they rise from this dead sleep, Peter, James, and John see this whole sight playing out before them. They see Jesus and Moses and Elijah. They see the very glory of God in Jesus, the Son. And Peter, being Peter, decides to speak up quickly before he can think about it before he can roll it around in his head. And he doesn't know what he's saying. Luke includes that great detail to tell us that Peter speaks like a fool. He says something so foolish, and here's what he wants. Lord, it is good that we are here. I love this. Let us stay. Let us make three tents one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, and we can hunker down on this glorious mountaintop. But it won't work. Peter can't stay on top of this mountain. Moses and Elijah won't stay on top of this mountain. And more importantly, Jesus can't stay on top of this mountain. It's time to exodus. It's time to depart. It's time to leave the glory of this mountain and travel the road to Jerusalem so that he can suffer and die like he told them he must do. This is a moment of glory that can't last. For Jesus has work to do. There's suffering to be had. But before we get to that, the show isn't quite done. Before they depart, before that exodus, a great cloud overshadows them suddenly. It sits down on top of them, surrounds them with its presence on top of this mountain, just like it did on Mount Sinai back in Exodus. And in the midst of this great cloud, shrouded in their fear, the disciples hear a voice. A voice booming just like it did at Jesus' baptism. It's the same voice. And God the Father bellows down from above, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to him. And suddenly that cloud lifts. And the disciples see the only thing needful. They look around and they see Jesus. Jesus only. Jesus alone. Jesus the God-man. Standing there normally. Without the glow and shine and glory radiating from him. The show's over. Life has returned to a dull, normal trudge through the hills and the valleys that come. 
and the disciples follow Jesus down into the valley, the valley of suffering in Jerusalem, of bleeding and sighing and crying and dying. They won't speak of all this again until the exodus is finished, until Jesus' work is done. Dear friends, it's an incredible account from Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> and as we think about it, we realize that mountaintop experiences are wonderful. We love them, just like Peter in our text. We delight in those moments that take our breath away. We want to bask in them, savor them. We want them to last forever. We love those things that leave us smiling and giggling with joy. But life is not just full of those moments. For between all those mountaintop experiences of life lie a whole bunch of valleys. Just as often, if not more, we find times of suffering. And you know what those valleys are like. Those times when our family and friends die. For crying out loud, we know that here with ten funerals in the last two months. As if that's not enough, there are those still living who are staring down the barrel of cancer or Alzheimer's or dementia or sickness or surgery or some other ailment of the body. Stuck in our sin, our bodies fail us and let us down. And death and sickness are just two of the many valleys we face. For there's more. There's depression and loneliness, fighting and marriage problems and divorces. There's work and deadlines money and government and taxes. So very many things leave us feeling like we're really in a valley, like we're in the valley of the shadow of death and not on top of a mountain with Jesus in our text. Dear friends, as we get ready to journey into a seasonal valley, as we get ready to journey into the valley of Lent, this mountaintop experience is yours. You're brought into it, included in it, made a part of it. And it's yours as you travel through the valleys of life, through the emotional and physical valleys of this world. Here in this place, in this sanctuary, we get to glimpse Jesus' glory. We get to gather together in God's house every week, and we get to glimpse what the disciples glimpsed. You get to see heaven meeting earth right here on this altar where the Lamb of God who reigns on the throne sits. And we gather around and join our voices with all of those who are part of that church. That Old Testament and New Testament church gathered around Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration is a picture of church. It's a picture here in this place where we get to hear Jesus speak his forgiveness into our ears, where we get to taste and see that he is good, where we get to rejoice together because Jesus didn't avoid the valley, because he trudged down off of that mount of transfiguration so that he could climb to the next one, that next mount where he would lay down his life in our place, where he would suffer and die to defeat death. Dear friends, whatever valleys are lying ahead, this morning we get to listen to the voice of Jesus. It's here in this place as he cries out to us. And as the Father cries out to us, listen to him. For he tells us what he told Peter, James, and John. Have no fear. Be at peace. As you come up to this altar this morning and collapse under the weight of your sins, that Jesus speaks to you and says, Take, eat, take, drink for the forgiveness of those sins. Take heart and rejoice, dear friends, for you are forgiven. You're glorified as you are united with Jesus in his baptism. No matter what life may look like, no matter how you may feel in the moment, Jesus says to take heart. Because on the mountaintop and in the valley, the promise of Jesus is the same. He's with you. He's traveled the road ahead of you. And his victory has already been won for you. So take heart. Take heart and join with Jesus as he heads to the cross. What better preparation could we have for Lent? What better hope could we find in this dark valley of a world? 
for the beloved Son of God, the Chosen One, the Savior, the Victor, stands and travels with us through all of it, speaking all the while a word of hope and forgiveness and love and life. Happy Transfiguration Day. Happy Lenten preparation. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all understanding, may it guard and keep you in Christ Jesus, our blessed Lord and our Savior.